Hello, <laughs> welcome to Hot Pot Talks. And this is part of the panel series for Bitter Orientals, Yellow Peril Unmasked. My name is Jen Sunshine here with my dear friend and longtime creative partner, David Ng. And together we are the co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, a media arts collective that produces intersectional and intergenerational film and artwork from underrepresented communities. We're also founding members of the Vancouver Artists Labor Union Cooperative, also known as Value Co-op, which is an artist-run worker cooperative whose goal is to provide flexible living wage income to artists. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that we are gathered here today from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Part of our work as labor activists and queer artists on conceded territories means working in solidarity with ongoing indigenous struggles for sovereignty, decolonization, reparations, and land back. Hapa Talks emerged during the pandemic from our collaboration with the Lim Association in Chinatown, historically a neighborhood of Chinese railroad laborers who were brought to settle indigenous territories as part of the ongoing colonial project. So why Hot Pot Talks? As Jen mentioned, uh, Value, uh, we're both members of Value Co-op, and Value Co-op has a studio in the Lim Sai Hor Kao Mock Association building in Chinatown. And when we moved into that studio in early 2020, um, we had long conversations about, um, you know, the role, roles that artists have played in gentrifying the neighborhood and how um, we might actively work uh, to to do work that serves the community um, and build reciprocal relationships, um, build reciprocal relationships in the community. And so over the past two years, we've been collaborating with the elders at the Lim Association to, to connect people uh, to the Chinatown community and also to issues that affect Chinatown, such as diaspora, xenophobia, systemic racism, intersectional solidarity building and Chinatown futurities. Bitter Oriental's Yellow Peril en masse grew out of this collaboration and out of a desire to address anti-Asian racism in real and tangible ways and to offer tools for audiences to take these learnings back into communities. Uh, so this panel series, so this is the the final one um, of, I think that we have, we've had five episodes, um, we'll touch on themes of diaspora, xenophobia, systemic racism, intersectional solidarity building, and Chinatown futurities. So you might have noticed some special red envelopes in our intro video. Um, we designed these uh, defund the police red envelopes that are on sale right now um, uh, on the Value Co-op website. Um, so that's valuecoop.ca. Uh, before we begin, we want to thank our funders, Canadian Heritage, Canada Council for the Arts, and BC Arts Council. And of course, we could not uh, do this without our incredible team behind the scenes, Ava and Cameron, who helped make Hot Pot Talks a reality. Uh, so I'm so excited to introduce our guest, honored guest today, our dear friend Jay Cavallo, who is a queer Filipino-Canadian visual artist based in Vancouver, BC. 
Heavily influenced by pop art, his work uses magazine collage to comment on pop culture, identity, and capitalism through his intersectional lens. Jay's, work, uh, Jay's works push the boundaries of collage with allegorical compositions meticulously arranged into portraits of celebrities, himself, and his musings. He has a BFA from Kwantlen uh, University and has shown in Vancouver since graduating in 2013. A series of cell portraits Jay created from 2017 to 2019 garnered the attention of exhibitions centered on queer Asian identity. In 2018, he exhibited with the Foundation for Asian American American independent media in Chicago, his first international showing. As well, Jay's work was part of exhibitions with Queer Asia in 2018 and 2019, for which he gave a virtual artist talk at the British Museum. 2020 saw his first local show focusing on queer Asian diaspora at the Sum Gallery. Yellow Peril, the celestial elements curated by Love Intersections, that's us. Um, <laughs> in that same year, he participated in a Pride in Chinatown MMXX, creating his first site-specific work at Fortune Sound Club. His self-portrait, De, uh, De Los Reyes, appears on the cover of the McGill Queen's University Press publication, Canadian Culinary Imaginations, which explores the role of food as multi-model media. Welcome, Jay. <laughs> hey. You have the longest bio. <laughs> it gives me like your entire tr uh, artist trajectory um, and all of your works. It's incredible. It's uh, so inspiring. How are you doing today? Um, you're oh. muted. There you oh, are. We can't oh. hear you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, tr try, well, why don't you try not using your earbuds? Maybe it's plugged in incorrectly. Uh, yeah. Yes, but now we're getting an echo. So try plugging it in again. Sorry about that. No, that's, that's okay. okay. We've done this before. <laughs> we know what we're doing and we will. <laughs> We will troubleshoot this together because oh, that's what friends are there we for. go there, there we go. go okay yeah, perfect. Sounds great. how are you it? doing today jay <laughs> i'm doing very well thank you so much for having me thank you for reading my bio that i wrote <laughs> i was gonna say i was like well we're talking about ego so it makes sense to have a lot of <laughs> so, well we i thought why don't we kick off the conversation you know um the last um the exhibit that we did together Yes. Um, Yellow Peril, the Celestial Elements. Yes. We wanted to talk talk about art, ego, healing, anti-Asian racism. I thought, why don't we start from where we left off? Yeah. Um, you know, mm -hmm. just for folks who, who don't know um, about the exhibit, the, the exhibit, um, Yellow Peril, the Celestial Elements, um, the themes were around queer East Asian futurities. Um, it grew from our film, Yellow Peril, Queer Destiny, um, and it opened February 1st, 2020. And of course, we know what happened a yeah. few weeks after that. <laughs> and essentially, this 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 the, this exhibit that focused on that had all these well, I guess you could say aspirations to think about imagining futurities. That future shifted very very quickly um, yeah. as the mm -hmm. pandemic hit, as yeah. this surge of anti Asian racism happened. Um, we pivoted actually our closing. Um, uh, uh, activation to have a conversation about what does Queer East Asian Futures look like in this um, resurgence of yellow peril. So I'm curious, maybe Jay, we can start with that question. What has that? Yeah. What has the pandemic been like for you, for you, and also for your arts practice? Um, it's been uh, it, it was a journey, but I'm I'm very happy to be where I am now, and very very grateful. It's it's you know thinking back to when we did Yellow Peril, the Celestial Elements. I I remember just feeling like just such on a high and feeling so affirmed to be in that exhibition with the two of you and Made in China and like I just remember being like so on top of the world and then you know right right at that moment <laughs> we barely had it and then all of a sudden the world yeah. shut down so it was just it was this kind of like it was a little bit of a a, like a reality check, I think, mm -hmm. which I mean, we're talking about ego here. Anytime that I have, anytime that I have an exhibition, anytime mm -hmm. I'm promoting new art, I always feel kind of like, you know, my ego is a little bit elevated. And <laughs> I, Are you a Leo by I'm, any chance? <laughs> August Leos. August, August Leos. Leos. <laughs> and I, I feel it's important to be honest about that. And, um, 
but uh, you know the the lesson that I have learned and I keep I keep learning every time like whenever I make art is to is to ground myself so you know when I when I think about that moment for us um, a couple years ago um, it was another kind of like um, reality check moment that I need and I, I'm going to continue to need and as we have our conversation today I feel like um, this theme of like you know remaining grounded like being mm -hmm. feeling affirmed but like feeling a grounded as well is is going to keep coming up um yeah thanks for sharing that i mean what i mean if can you share maybe some of the struggles that you experienced at the height of the pandemic i know we were all kind of you know basking in the yeah. in the like the visibility and the yeah. you know the 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 just just how many people showed up to support our exhibition um and then of course quickly soon after that you know things went you know yeah, global and if I may just quickly also just add, I just want to, because I've been thinking about this a lot. You I mean, 2018, 2019, we saw rice cake. We saw, mm -hmm. you know, the house of rice. Yeah. You know, all of this energy, which is why we made the film and which is why the, this yeah. built up into the exhibit. All of a sudden that shifted. I just wanted to sort of place that because it, it was a reminder to me of, of that energy that was happening and mm -hmm. how quickly that shifted. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. For for me too, it was like I was I was coming off of like before uh, Yellow Peril, I was coming off of two years of doing self portraits. It was like it was me, me, me. It was my story. It was vanity. It was <laughs> narcissism, and it was. And then all of a sudden, you know, having having the world shut down, having like opportunities dry up, it really it really became a time for me to find find the the real internal strength that we have as human beings you know and and you know i think there was this period of like i i was trying to find this strength um externally through my artwork through my image and um you know looking back over the last few year two years this this was kind of you know a kick in the butt to mm -hmm. to get real with myself and uh you know find find the strength that i needed to get through and mm -hmm. it was very hard Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been very honest even during like all three seasons of Hot Pot Talks um, that the pandemic really revealed a lot of my own perceptions of myself and my insecurities and my ability to, you know, even carry on a conversation articulately and eloquently, like using words. Like I just felt the pandemic really messed with my like my focus, my concentration, my ability to think and talk and do. Um, and I still don't really know how I can recover from the gen that was pre-pandemic and that, that everyone knows. And now I just have to live with this weird hybrid of a being. So, yeah, yeah you know, mm -hmm. I have to say one of the, it, for me, and I know this has happened for many other people too, but during the pandemic, it was a very big wake up call of like, you know, so, I should also backtrack and say at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, like many other artists, everything dried up for me as well. Yeah. I was fortunate, like I'm fortunate to be in a weird way. I'm fortunate to be in school and my funding kicked in right as the pandemic started. So I want to recognize that I'm really, really lucky. Mm -hmm. But the freelancing thing, like every, every, things slowed down for like maybe two, three months, like really, really like came, came to a halt. Yeah. But then everything just went crazy again. Mm -hmm. And like, like capitalism just figured itself out. <laughs> and, it I've honest, and I've honestly never been so burnt out. And it yeah. really, I've had many moments of saying to my partner, saying like, why am I doing this? Like, obviously I love the work that Jen and I do. And I love the, the you know, it, it, it does, it feeds me. It's what I want to do. This is what I, this is what I want to do. Yet at the same time, sort of chasing, chasing these chasing um, these projects and deliverables constantly is mm. has also been a wake up call. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the previous, in, in our previous conversation before this talk in thinking about like healing and this concept of healing and what, what um, journeys that we need to go to as artists to be artists, mm -hmm. that's also been a very, really big sort of, um, I guess, reckoning for me personally. <laughs> I just came across this tweet that I, I just have to share because I yes, sent it please. to like all of them. It just was today and it's from um, at Gloria Elam, Elamru um, uh, and she's a black activist and she writes, she tweeted, I want a soft life. 
I want ease. I want relaxation. I do not want to hustle. I do not want to grind. Grinding wears you down to the brittle nothingness. I do not right. want to work my life away. I want enjoyment and rest, not as rewards, but as practice. My life will be a practice in joy. And mm. that just yeah. super moved me because yeah. as an artist, like what do we know other than the life of grinding and, and hustling, yeah. you know? Thank you yeah. for sharing that. Uh, the The word that stuck out for me from what you just said was softer. And mm -hmm. when I think of when when I heard that, it made me think of um, when we think of capitalism, it's always harder, mm -hmm. better, mm -hmm. faster. You know, mm -hmm. that's it's that song. You yeah. know, it's it's always and we think of that and, and our minds are trained to think that 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 harder is better. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. more is better. And um, that's untrue. I just don't think that that's true. And we have mm -hmm. to unlearn, you know, we have to unlearn this capitalism, this capitalistic mind frame. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, sometimes what I've learned is like, you know, I burnt out as well. You know, David, you're talking about that. And, and I went through a similar thing where I was like, if I kind of went through this existential crisis, because it was like, I kept burning out. And I'm like, if mm -hmm. I'm burning myself out to do my art, then how can I say that I love myself? How can I say that I value my life? if I'm hustling to the point where I don't yeah. want to do my art anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So softer, softer. I love that. I, I, I would. Love yeah, because I, I love that. I love that quote. I would also maybe add to I think it's also like a recalibration of what we think is productive mm -hmm. because yeah. the thing is we can't. This is the thing that I think it, it, under capitalism, it's really hard. It's 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 hard to for people to comprehend <laughs> that aren't artists that artists actually need like clear space to be bored really mm -hmm. i need in, boredom to be in, creative in order to be creative yeah. and yeah. if yeah. we're constantly yeah. chasing being productive under a very neoliberal yeah. currency where you know yeah. we're you know doing workshops and do, creating you know c constantly creating things and, and doing things right that might can be considered productive, but we're not being artists, mm -hmm. you know, or we're not doing a very good job of being an artist. Yeah. So I, I, I'm wondering, Jay, you know, we when we were talking about healing, um, yeah, we had we had a we had a, a long conversation about what that that looks like in terms of. I think you were talking about in terms of like you know your own journey, thinking through your healing process in your art, but then also how it's being received by 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 people and how you were sort of navigating that. Do you want, yeah. do you want to maybe share with us? For sure, for sure. I think that when I started doing self-portraits, uh, I think in 2017, um, uh, I was in a really bad place. I was uh, very depressed. I was burnt out. Um, I was coming off of just, you know, churning out commissions, which I, you know, mm -hmm. I was grateful for at the time, but, um, I realized I was just like putting all of my creative energy into serving other people. And, you know, I, I didn't really know what to do. I, I couldn't afford therapy. I know mm -hmm. I want to say that and be mm -hmm. honest that mm -hmm. I couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I, I really enjoyed when I was in art school was, was uh, self-portrait. And so I started doing these and I didn't really know what they were going to be at the time. It was just, it was just like the first thing I, you know, I look at the very first one and I, I see a little bit of like unsure of how to my, I'm, I'm unsure of how I'm going to represent myself. And then they just continued to grow from there. And, um, but I have to say like, you know, it was also a very confusing time for me. I did, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure what was what, who was, who was I, you know, am I this image? It was, it was a very um, complicated time. Um, but I was also experiencing so much creative energy from what I was doing and my, I could see the, my, my practice grow and my technique grow. It, mm. And, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a Pandora's box because I, I, I definitely, you know, as, as we've seen so far, I have, a, I have a natural ego about me probably. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it was just like, you know, and I, I, after I did, I was like, well, we're here now. So what do we do? Um, and um, yeah, so I, I I could see that like my my artwork was flourishing. So I mm -hmm. knew that I was onto something. And mm -hmm. um, but eventually, I, I couldn't really quite articulate it at the time. But I after a few of them, after two years, I was like, I don't really feel like I'm growing as a person. I feel like I'm just becoming more vain. There was <laughs> there was one moment like there was one moment I looked around my apartment 
And there was like, there were like three cell phones just, like, just in my apartment. I was like, oh my God, who are you? So I had to like, I just like turned them all around. And um, I also felt, cause I, I did an artist talk during that time and mm. I was so unprepared to do it. Like I, you know, I, I was still processing um, what I was going through in real time. And I was asked to do this artist talk and um, uh, forgot where I was going with this. Can anyway, I, was, can I oh, ask, yes. can I ask when you were, when you said that you were unprepared for this artist talk, can I ask how much of it be, you being unprepared was wrapped up in this ego oh my God, of knowing of that you're just going to wing it and it will be fine. All of it. <laughs> yeah. All of it. Yeah. 100% of it. And um, yeah, so, and, and how was I supposed to know? Like, and, and so what I want to segue into is that, um, well, just to cap off that, that artist talk moment, mm -hmm. um, I gave this talk and it was about, it was about, you know, the work that I was making, the self-portraits, how I was creating my own representations. It was all, it was all stuff that I, I believed in and I, I understood the theory about it even though I didn't really like feel a transformation going on because of the representation representation I was creating. I was like, mm -hmm. well, I got to give this artist talk. So here we are. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then afterward, I felt a little bit strange. I, 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 I thought about what I had just done and I was like, so did I just give an artist talk that was about how I deserve to be seen <laughs> because I'm a <laughs> queer person of color? Yeah. Mm. And I felt like, yeah, <laughs> that's a little strange. Like, <laughs> well, yeah. I, mean, I mean, definitely, definitely important. But it was like, you know what I mean? I'll let you interject. I mean, <laughs> that's why we started Love Intersection. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. I'm and curious. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was, I'm curious. So, so we, I mean, obviously we have very different practices, but I'm curious because, it, Jay, I mean, what it sounds like also was you went from doing, um, from the point of departure of yourself as the inquiry yeah. into sort of thinking about other other angles of of addressing different issues. I find, I mean, uh, Jen and I have had this conversation, but maybe I'll speak for myself personally. I feel like our work in Love Intersections has kind of gone the opposite direction where mm -hmm. we've spent, a, we focus be um, decentering ourselves. ourselves. But then also recognizing that part of our practice needs to be interrogating our own where we're situated, right? And right. we'll we'll get into the anti Asian racism piece of that in a, in a moment too. But um, so I'm I'm curious about about that journey and 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 if if that reflection of mine to you is is accurate or what what has that journey been like in in moving from self portrait and then thinking about um yeah other other angles or other approaches. Um. I, what I feel like I've done is I've actually, um, even though we're talking about self-portraits and it's, it's um, um, I actually started off like just like being a, a pop artist. You know, when I was a kid, I was drawing, um, you know, drawing pictures of celebrities and, and TV show characters and, and logos. It was always like pop influenced. Mm -hmm. um, and even when I did the self-portraits, there's very much still like a pop, uh, a pop vein towards them um or about them and um so when i shifted out of that i was like well how do i how do i address what i've learned from doing self-portraits and and seeing how i was affected by media and not just mm -hmm. myself seeing how how um popular media is is harmful to all kinds of people how seeing how it's sexist and misogynistic and cisnormative mm -hmm. and all of these things you know i i, I sift through this media all day mm -hmm. and and magazines age horribly like you you see yeah. how you know how the, you see the messaging yeah of of how we are conditioned to see the world and um and so i i i was interrogating not just this for myself but also how i had learned how to discriminate and uh, against other people i i really woke up to my own privilege during that time as well mm -hmm. and um, I think one of the reasons I stopped doing them also is I realized like as a, as a, you know, as a man, I'm like, I'm definitely I, privileged and that 
you know, there's more, there's more to what I want to do with my art than just like, you know, prop myself up as this, as this, you know, this representation of a, of a man. And like, there's, there's so much more that I want to do with my mm -hmm. art um, for me and for my own healing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, like, it was a, I think the time was like, it was, it was great for me to do that. I was happy to do that. But after a while, it was like, I don't need this. And mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, you know, see what I can do um, in other ways. And yeah. I'm still figuring that out, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? You're, you mentioned you, to make your own art as as healing. What kind of art do you want to make? And yeah, tell, tell us more about I that. I actually want to separate the, uh, the art and healing process a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. they can be interrelated. Um, yeah. But I think that it has to be, I think that it has to be, you know, looked at separately as well mm. you know your art your art is not healing in and of itself um mm. you need you need a healing component also um mm. and that's you know that's something that i learned um can i share with you a little bit of um what i read from i hope we choose love by please um, Ch i cheng tom because <laughs> um, this this really did like mm. change um and affirmed what i i felt i went through mm -hmm. Um, so this is from her essay, A School for Storytellers, and um, she writes, The storyteller is an artist which is not in, its, in itself a qualification for healing work. It is a qualification for artistic work. And given that art frequently springs from a place of trauma, it is possible that artists are less suited on average than the general population for healing or mentoring work, which demands a certain level of stability from the healer and mentor. Mm -hmm. I read that a year ago and immediately I was mm. like, a light bulb went off and mm. I was like, I need to, this is why, and it was like, this is why I am experiencing so experiencing so much anxiety this is why i'm burning myself out all the time becoming depressed is because i think and i was sort of conditioned to think that you know artists are these like you know spiritual mythical beings that like you know heal from their artwork mm -hmm. and i thought i was doing it because i was like oh you know my artwork is flourishing that must mean i'm healing i remember i did one of the self-portraits and it really did feel like I was healed. You know, I got this rush out of doing it and I, I saw what I was doing. I saw the finished product. And there is there is an ego element inherent yeah. in making art. There just is. And when it when your own face is in it, also that adds another yeah. element mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. And you know, I remember I made that and it was just like I was on a high like I'd never felt before. Yeah. And you yeah. couldn't tell me anything. And but I just I kept having to make them and then I would fall into this and then I would go back to my, you know, my old sort of conditioned thinking. And I, you know, I I didn't feel like I was healing, even though I would have these moments where I felt healed. Mm -hmm. right. And so after I read that excerpt from from Kai Cheng Tong, thank you so much, Kai Cheng Tong, if you're listening. Oh, my God, <laughs> like that really changed everything. And it made me realize, like, you need it's great that you, you know, you have an art practice and that this can guide you towards you know your healing which i think it did i think doing mm -hmm. the self-portraits they guided me in the direction of of recognizing my ego but then the healing portion of it is learning when to check it yeah mm -hmm. and, and how to mm -hmm. check it yeah and um yeah so that's what it's been and so i want to say that uh, to answer your question finally um mm -hmm. <laughs> that it's not for me it's not just about making art i've mm -hmm. i've been making art you know for me it's 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 just what all regular everyday humans need. You know, yes, we yes. need, we need medication. We yeah. need yeah. therapy. We need money for these things, you know? Yeah. And I think this idea of the artist as like healing from their artwork, I think it sends the wrong message to artists and to people who consume art. Um, and, you know, maybe if we rearrange our, th our, our viewpoint of who mm -hmm. the artist is in society, yeah. you know, more artists would have access to better healing. 
yeah. resources. Yeah, I so I never knew, you know, whether or not the, you know, the term or the category of artist was harmful or not. You know, David and mm -hmm. I have talked about this at length where we never called ourselves an artist for the longest time. And that is also true to a lot of creative people who do, does, who don't necessarily have the the brand of an artist mm -hmm. um, as like their vocation, for example, and but they are in fact just creative people and they like to create. Um, because for the longest time I thought, is that just another neatly packaged under kind of mm. capitalism kind of like um, title that traps you in this, you know, self-performing, self-grandizing, -grand uh, you know, kind of role. Um, I never knew that. And I don't think, you know, and then the longer that I embraced the title, as, as soon as other people started calling me as an artist, Jen's is this artist, um, or introducing me as an artist, then the ego became attached to that title. Whereas before, yeah. you know, I think, Dave, you know, um, Jay, you spoke of as like a kid, you were always, you know, embedded in this practice. Like you were always an artist, you weren't always in creative. Mm -hmm. Like, so was I in just all of these different ways. Um, and I, it was, there was never a kind of like, ego attached to it until there was an audience attached to it. Mm. And then the audience is the one who's telling you, um, is grading you what your yeah. art is, you know, yeah. from the teacher, from your your community, from, you know, from your parents even. When they suddenly start to, to grade you, that's when things started to kind of get wrapped into this like identity and yeah. ego of like yeah. you, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, it also raises an interesting, I'm just thinking though, I'm also just thinking like um, there's something there's something complicated around you know the fact that as artists we're obviously holding our own going through our own experiences and uh, uh, many of us have tr you know certain traumas that get that are you know feed through our art but then it's also then when when and just hearing this sort of cycle that happens where you get sort of applauded for it, but mm -hmm. you're not actually dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then it gets put out in the world and then, but you get held up to, oh yes, yeah. you're doing this amazing work. It's like, well, I'm actually still dealing with that stuff yes. too. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. And we are, we are not as artists, our work. We, you, like yeah. we, we have, we have like, Art is a thing. We are. But then we are too. Sorry, continue. No, continue. No, continue. No, no, no. no, because 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 no, this this conversation comes up when when there is a person when there's an artist that is canceled, right. and then the argument being like, well, you have to separate the artist and the you know the art and the artist. You know, you right. can't puni You know, you can't be right. punitive towards the artist that has done right. terrible, awful things in history right. or in current times. It is wrapped up in the person. Yes. But yeah. and yet there is a, a distinction as well. Well, so I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, um, uh, I was thinking about that as well as we were um, as leading up to this. Yeah. And we, we only have this conversation about separating art from artists when, when we want to yeah. cancel someone. Yes, yes. We yeah. only yes. have that conversation yes. in that Good point. context. Yeah, but Good point. we also are not, as artists, the best thing that we do. You know? Yeah. We are not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, like... We, we just are not our art at all, I think, yeah. is what the thing is. Yeah. And, like, you know, I, I, that's what I had, to, I had to figure out when I was doing self-portraits. I was, like, I was trying to, like, live up to what I was, the me that I was presenting. And I was, like, oh, this is not me at all. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I could, you know, we, we have to look at our, uh, I think, sorry, I'm just, I'm just going to speak from my own experience. <laughs> no weeds here. great. I have to speak from my own experience. And... You know, I could I could do a self portrait that is is you know really inspiring and that I want to I want to to make. Yeah. You know, and that it does come from a you know a genuine place, but that is not me. That does not mean that's me all the time. Mm -hmm. I could you know tomorrow have a conflict from with a friend and be a totally toxic person. You know, yeah. I'm. Yeah. Oh, well, you, Jake. I think we can't hear you anymore. Do oh. that thing, uh, but, unplug and plug in again. Uh, you know, it makes okay. me think, though, you know, y but the other thing that it makes me think about, too, is also, you know, art doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, you know, like, I'm just thinking specifically about even the work that w we've been doing with Bitter, Bitter Orientals. And the reason why Jen, you and I really quite struggled quite a bit for over a, a year since, actually since the exhibit, 
um, closed in 2020 till now, because yes, there's a surge of anti-Asian racism, which, you know, because of the work that we do, we're immersed in trying to think about how our arts practice can make interventions there, but it doesn't exist in a vacuum. And what I mean by that is it's not divorced from anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. No. Mm -hmm. And so making this, and this is maybe a good segue to talk about Bitter Orientals, <laughs> the art for Bitter Orientals, but you so know, smooth. But, you know, like this is this is this it was the tension that we've had. Right. Is that, you know, the 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 how do we think through and work through in our practice anti-Asian racism, which is our experience, but it doesn't right. exist in a vacuum. It's not yeah. inseparable from it's yeah. situated yeah. in anti-black and anti-Indigenous mm -hmm. racism. Right, 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 mm -hmm. right. So if I may, <laughs> so if, for those uh, who don't know, uh, Jay uh, designed our amazing graphic uh, for Bitter Orientals. Um, and I thought this might be a, a opportunity for us to actually talk about, yeah. obviously, Jay, we wanted, we, this was the reason why we wanted to work with you was because um, the, 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 the themes that we wanted to work through were so, we thought your practice would be so perfect for it. Um, I don't know where, what, I don't know if I have a question. How, I, I, I have a question. Ahead, yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, I want to know, Jay, what was your process like? And, you know, how did you feel after creating, like, how did, how did you feel when you were asked um, by David and I to create this graphic in the first place? And then how did it feel, you know, after like completing it? Um, yeah, yeah, what's, and, and what, uh, what your process was like creating this? Um, I, so David, uh, I think David reached out to me and asked, mm -hmm. or, or actually, no, I think we're at dinner and you, you, you mentioned, uh, doing this. And, um, I thought it was a good fit immediately because I was already independently sourcing, sourcing images that, uh, for, I don't know what I, I do that all the time, um, that I thought would be work well with this. And, um, I thought, um, well, first of all, I, was kind of honored. I was like, oh my God, you want me to design this, <laughs> this, um, this graphic. And um, I guess I had been a little bit, you know, for, for the last year, I've been uh, sort of secluded working on a, a series uh, that I'll talk about at some point. Mm -hmm. But um, I thought, I'm trying to think back to this moment. I was very, I was very heartwarmed because I, I was isolating myself for so long and it just made me feel so included. Mm -hmm. um, in uh in the community and i was like oh you know i haven't you know really been uh that visible or doing that many things and so i was just honestly just very like honored that you would ask me um and then the process was was i was just sort of figuring it out um as we went along because um you had some points that you wanted to hit and yeah. i had images that i wanted to incorporate just that i was using independently <laughs> and um yeah, I thought it was interesting because I, I so when I was making this, I was like, OK, well, I'm, I'm trying to like I, I think the pro the prompt was to sort of recreate like a Chinese wrapping paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went through this whole thing of like, am I allowed to do this? I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm on. But then I was like, well, I am an eighth Chinese. So I guess <laughs> so like, kind of like qualifying all of these things for like, why, like, can I do this kind of work? Which, I, you know, I have to say it happens often because like, course. you know, I'm, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm constantly, um, you know, coming across people and experiences that are not of my own when I, when I look through images. Um, but then also another thing that I think about a lot in my, in my work, which applies to this piece and also applies to everything that I do is that, um, my work is about appropriation, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a, like, you know, we, we are, we're familiar with appropriation being used um, in, in racist terms and in ways that are harmful. Um, but also my practice is kind of the, the whole point of my practice is appropriative. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I, I think that, you know, every artist, you know, and for myself, I had to look at it as like, um, I, I have to I have to look at what I'm doing and see how I can, you know, how I can adapt what I'm doing to the climate that we're in. And mm -hmm. so I thought it would be, it's actually interesting that I have a practice that, that is about appropriation. Yeah. And, yeah. and so when I was looking at, when I was looking at images to create this graphic, um, I, I started, and the images that I sourced myself, 
I come a lot of images that um, in advertising that appropriate mm -hmm. from from Asian culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started pulling those away separately um, on my own. And yeah. then, yeah, when you asked me to do this, I, I, I put everything together. Yeah. I'm, and I'm also I'm curious about we had a conversation, a really interesting conversation about the form collage, too, because I think what drew us to the wrapping paper idea, it was a it was an inspiration from an Asian artist, I think, based in Australia, who just layered. I forget what it was, but what we liked about it was the layering of all of these different elements of. I think for them, they were talking about some diasporic Asian culture. And we were inspired by that and wanted to pack in all of what we just discussed, you know, the complexity of mm -hmm. speaking about anti-Asian racism in this climate and the particular um, form that it's taken right now. And and we thought like, well, with collage, it could be, there's there's so many ways that you can sort of infuse the, those layers. Mm -hmm. But sorry, Jen, I'm going to put you on the spot. You had an interesting question, though. Well, so that was where form. I was, yeah, that's what I wanted to actually ask you before. I think like it just, I never got to ask you whether this was part of the form or not. And, and so I, you know, my understanding and even looking at this graphic right now, I'm just making this full screen. Um, you know, like a lot of it is, um, a lot of it is, is are tropes, like tropes and stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. um, that are Asian for lack of a better, you know, yeah. category. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, we also wanted to include, you know, in the kind of, bottom area, the defund the police, which is near the kind of virus, uh, you know, logo there. So I wasn't sure, you know, in terms of the, the form for collage, whether you can, because when you're doing something like that satire, you have all these stereotypes and that's why it's understood as satire because it's like making apparent and even exacerbating and like exaggerating the tropes and the stereotypes. Therefore, we can read that as a kind of satire and irony, right? Mm -hmm. But in this case, like you see, there's like Scar Scarlett Johansson, who we know is coded as she's basically an honorary Asian by this point. Um, <laughs> you know, you've got like Fu Manchu, you've got dragons, you've got all these Asian tropes. Um, but then you have this like defund the police. Is that is that appropriate in this form? Clearly it is because you put it in there. So, I, you know, obviously I trust you as an as a collage artist, but I just didn't know. So can you kind of explain the form of collage and and the balance? And is it just, you can't just stick everything in there. You have to have some kind of like message, you know, coming through, right? Mm -hmm. um, my process, so the whole point of collage to me is is playing with context. You know, and mm -hmm. so I I like to say that when I um, and this was you know this was this for a specific thing. So this yeah. the process is a little different. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Then you know when I'm collaging, um, you know uh, pieces that um, are just are just my practice. Um, but the whole point is to play with context. I'm taking things from different magazines, different time periods um, uh, that are are produced for different, you know, categories of people. And I, I you know, the, the point of it is to see how it all fits together. And I think that, I think that it's actually important, you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. yes, this is, if we're talking about this graphic, this is a, uh, you know, this is for video orientals, you know, and I'm, you know, we're supposed to categorize this and just think of this through one lens, but that's not how the world exists, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not how, how you know I you know I see different marginalized groups existing. You know I I'm trying to get in the framework of of it's not you know one of us at a time. It's all of us at the same time. You know we're all sort of working towards similar things congruently. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, when I think about collage, I think about I think about this this ability in this process of taking things that are meant to be consumed separately and putting them together and making them make sense. Mm -hmm. mm. Can you tell us, uh, just, we, we can move on, but I want to just, um, you, you, the, the font was very special. Um, oh, yes. and I don't, I don't think we've ever <laughs> talked so about it. Can you t tell us the, about the inspiration to the font? Um, the font, um, the font is by, um, is, um, uh, Kath Park Hong is sort of uh, inspired by Kathy Park Hong's um, Minor Feelings book. 
uh, which came out and and deals with um, anti, you know, it, you know, de deals with the Asian experience. Mm -hmm. And I had ac actually already sourced this font. I really wanted to use it. So when you asked me to do it, I was like, oh my god, I have the best font. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That's and so you exciting. know, <laughs> yeah. and um, yeah, I love fire. Yeah. We love oh, fire. fire signs. Are we fire all signs. fire tigers in this room? Oh yeah. I don't think. <laughs> Is Jay Jay's are we're the same age? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we've just, talked about this. <laughs> Jay, I'm just conscious of the time. You have yeah. a you I think you may have a Talk uh, about your exhibit. Special uh, Yeah, I'm I'm having a show. It's not really a secret at this point. I'm like it's a secret and then like I tell everyone that I see every day. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, I'm having my first solo exhibition. Um, it's going to be in May, um, curated by Paul Wong. Um, so I'm very, very excited. I've been working on um, the artwork for the last year and um, it's great. I'm in like, I'm in, um, I'm just in a very appreciative uh, mm -hmm. space that I get to do that, that I get to live here and have, have my studio, make my work. I'm just so, so, so grateful. Um, uh, tell us, can you, can you tell us the title? What can you yeah. tell us the theme? So <laughs> this so if we're talking, you know, a, a lot of what we've been talking about is is healing, and um, I think for me, what this what this show represents for me is 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 that in, in and of itself, it's not really a show about healing. It's it's my own personal, um, it's my own it's my return to pop art. You know, I mm -hmm. when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a pop artist. I was always inspired by like Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, these these big art um, pop art movements that came from America and Britain, but also, you know, many other places. And I never, I just never felt as like a queer Filipino immigrant that lived in Canada that like I could be a pop artist. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, when I was doing self portraits, I, I really didn't think I would, I would go the mainstream pop art route. I was like, no, I'm going to be like a niche. It was like a safe, like, yeah, I'm going to be like a niche, like self portrait artist, whatever. Um, and, um, yeah, there was, there was a feeling of when I was doing that work that, um, I didn't deserve what I wanted, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, I didn't deserve to have that space. So after, uh, you know, I, I realized I didn't want to do self-portrait anymore. I was like, you know, you should, you should go in this direction and, um, go back to what, um, your original love was. Mm -hmm. So it's a very pop art exhibition. Um, it's called Extra, which I love. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm I'm very excited. It's you know I I think about when I was a kid looking through all of like this printed media, looking at magazines, looking at comic books, feeling so lonely and introverted and um, unseen, mm -hmm. and you know how that that like little kid just like needed to be seen so badly that when I, you know, I, I started making all of these self portraits. And I think around that time too, there was this, there was still this like shame of like, you know, I didn't want to, a, a shame about that introverted kid that was quiet and timid and that was like an Asian stereotype, you know? Yeah. And so my, my reaction to that was to create an image of myself that was the opposite. Mm. And when I think about the last year, I, I haven't been interacting with that many people. I've been spending a lot of time in isolation, just very much like I was when I was a kid <laughs> with all of this material. And, you know, it was part of me, it was a part of me for forgiving myself for just being me, for mm -hmm. who I was at the time, you know? And, and it's okay to, to be by myself and to be alone mm -hmm. and to, um, and I, I made the show that I've always wanted to make, and I'm so, so happy. I'm so excited to, to share it with all of you. Great. And where can people find out more information? Um, I'm going to post it on uh, my Instagram, most likely. So at J-A-Y. Oh, you've got it there. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big poster. I'm also working on posters. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> a little pun there. I'm all about yeah. the pun. Um, yeah. Very so cool. you, don't worry. You you will hear from me. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I don't know. What are you What are you working on next? Obviously, the show. Do you Do you want to? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can I ask you a couple questions? 
Yeah. Please. Do I have time yeah. for that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I was. I remember because you know this was. Um, I think you had started Hot Pot Talks a year ago. Has it been a year yet? Oh, what is time? Uh, it's been it a year. Yeah. It's been a year. So <laughs> around this time, I remember you know the um, when you all started um, Hot Pot Talks. I was really intrigued by you know the conversations that you wanted to have, and it's been three seasons. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> Yeah, how are you feeling about, you know, uh, our future? And like, have you found any through lines between between all of the people that you've you've um, interviewed over the last year? Um, you know, the food is like a pretty universal through line that every yes. guest and we also have to remind uh, to, to ask our our favorite. Yes. Um, question mm -hmm. uh, but so food is often the kind of the main through line um, and beyond that there's like lots of shared sim you know there's lots of similarities um, but for the most part I have consistently been surprised every episode that's great yeah and and that is I think I, I, I and this is my own kind of self kind of prescribed saving grace mm -hmm. is that I never get stuck in a kind of rut with any situation or I don't think I do because I'm constantly being surprised by situations and people and contexts. Mm -hmm. um, and so every time I get, you know, I start thinking this way where it's like, oh, I, I assume about, I make assumptions about people. Mm -hmm. um, when the surprise occurs, then it challenges my assumptions about people, right? So then that challenges me ultimately. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so far, I don't have. I, I don't know if there's been any kind of like through line. David might be more insightful. I love that already. Us. It's very hopeful and and yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I kind of touched on it, but you know, it um, for me personally, it's been and 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 you know, Jen and I have talked about this at our retreat in September too. But part of personally my practice, and I think part of what we're thinking through with love intersections is like, you know, as people of color, if we can even use that umbrella term, uh, who experience racial marginalization as Asian people. You know, I touched on this earlier, but how are we situated in anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism? But I really sort of, I, um, you know, from season one, I'm just thinking at the end of season one, I, you know, I'm a very different views from what I said at the finale, yes. but I really struggled with, you know, when I was seeing a lot of what I, what I recognize now as what I, how it landed on me was navel gazing. I felt like a lot of like people just saying, well, you know, yes, there's anti-Asian racism, but you know, we must support black and indigenous people, which is true. But there was like, but it, it ended there. Well, what's the know? next thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, there's a discomfort and this is again, the, the, the tension with it that underpins bitter orientals is like, you know, we, ex yes, anti-Asian racism is a thing. Obviously it's a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet our position as POCs is at a very different place in that racial hierarchy that has been imposed by colonialism and white supremacy yeah. than black and indigenous people, right? And yeah. yes, we come from, and you know, then we get into the complication of the umbrella of Asian too, which many of us come from histories of migration and displacement and diaspora. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, as you know, as Jen opened uh, Hot Pot Talks every every week, it, our our displacement and migration is a part of the ongoing colonial project, and it continues to be that today, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so, I don't have an answer, but it's sort of every season has been a new sort of journey for me of thinking about and it really really interrogating what we're doing, <laughs> what is yeah. Hot Pot Talks, right? What is yeah. this work? I think it's, it, you know, this practice, what is it doing? And um, yeah, how do we continue? How, how is it? How, yeah. How, what is the work doing and how can we do it better? And how can we, yeah, address and the it, things? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if I may go full circle, because this all wraps up, comes back to the ego, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. Every season, I think we start to become more and more aware of how our ego, you know, is manifesting itself. And so perhaps at the beginning of Hot Pot Talks where we just wanted to kind of like, you know, hang out with friends, people that we're, we admire, people that we're inspired by. And there was an ego of like, well, we should just start this thing because we're all in lockdown and yeah. let's do this mm -hmm. virtual hangout mm -hmm. to season three where we become, everything now becomes 
more and more intentional. Yeah. Um, where we're focused, like we're becoming more focused and like we had a whole series on abolition. Um, yeah. And so we're, we're just kind of honing and refining and defining um, our, our practice. I, I, yeah, and I, I'll just quickly add, sorry, Jay, I, I know you, oh. you have something to say too. I'm, I'm also just reflecting on like, you know, we very deliberately put together like people from different disciplines, like you, for example, Jay, and from completely different fields. And what happens in that encounter, those, mm -hmm. that, that sort of, we could, we, you could frame it as like, un, like tension or not tension, but like a, even like sometimes difficult conversations or questions that we don't know the answers to, but mm -hmm. that sort of encounter from the diff people from very different practices mm -hmm. yeah. has k led to, in, you know, conversations that I didn't think that we would have like actually this one right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sorry uh, you're gonna say something jay <laughs> i was gonna say that uh, um i i think that also you know again uh, remembering the the topic of of ego we have to remember that like um as as artists as as cultural workers um whatever you know we identify as mm -hmm. that we're, you know, we're not supposed to have all of the answers. We're supposed to ask the questions mm. and, and ask, ask good questions. And that's what, you know, that's what to me, what I thought was so interesting when, when you started Hoppa Talks of like, you're, ans you're asking really good questions. And mm. yeah, I, you know, um, the answers will, the answers will come. And it's very humbling to say, I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we don't, we don't always know sometimes, but we're, we're trying. Mind you, sometimes we don't ask the, the, the right questions or the best That's questions. Yeah. There are yeah. episodes yeah. where I'm like, oh, I should have asked this question. Right. And it was a missed opportunity because I wasn't prepared enough. Again, my ego thinking I could just wing this episode, right? Yes, yes, yes. Like all of those things. Um, but even I'm the, in, I would also add, I mean, the opposite too. You could be over prepared, but it was the wrong question. Yes. And that has happened too. Yes, yes, yes many yes. times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should well, we I'm, ask? Sorry, go oh, ahead. Yes. Go. Yes. Oh, yeah, we, no, have, go for it. we have to ask the question we ask all of yes. our hot pot talks <laughs> guests. <I> <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite hot pot uh, ingredient or experience? So I, um, when I, when I think of hot pot, I think of um, like my family would and I would go after when I was a kid. We would after church we'd go to a Chinese restaurant and we would have hot pot like in the Chinese in like a Chinese restaurant. Um, so that's my memory of hot pot. Um, until I met, and then I met David, <laughs> and I started having hot pot at David's house, and I was like, "Oh, this is a whole other thing. This is, <laughs> I don't know anything about hot pot at all." Well, David so, also goes like above and beyond, so it's not a realistic kind of expectation. I still, I'm, I mean, it's always so good. Like I, yeah. I like I will eat whatever's in front of me, but uh, what I do is I. Um, I stand next to Dave and I see what he puts in his thoughts and I do this. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to just copy you. That's so funny because me and my uh, friend, Sean, we do that at hot pot restaurants. We, we watch the other Asian people who, who, who clearly know what they're doing. And then right. we like order what they're having. Oh, and funny. then we'll, we'll have their, right. their sauce too. And I couldn't tell you what anything was. I'm just like, you know what? I'm just, yeah. And it's always yeah. so good. I mean, it's you, so you good. honestly can't go wrong. Yeah. Is, I'm curious. Uh, sorry, I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Is yeah. there like um, in Filipino culture, is there a, like a version of hot pot that's specific to the Philippines? Oh, I don't know. Um, mm. Maybe like Sin Sinigang? Sinigang. Sinigang. Yeah. Sinigang. Mm. Sinigang. Mm. I would say. Um, I love Sinigang. Sound off in the chat so if you have any other Filipino <laughs> 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 people. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I would say good. Good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. David, you make yeah. synagogue. I have made synagogue. I've seen on your story. Oh. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> waiting for my invite. Yeah. <laughs> I want to try David synagogue. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jay, so much for you, this lively episode of Hot Pot Talks. It's been <laughs> such a pleasure to talk to you. And it's just always, it's it's like another being a friend um, or being friendly and friends, are, like already friends um, to be, uh, to, to, to enjoy Hot Pot Talks together. So I'm just excited to see you in person next, you whenever too. that may be. Maybe we'll have Hot Pot, I think. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Hot Pot, my show, Extra. Yes. yes. <laughs> <In May. laughs> 
Thank you, Great. Jay. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah. Bye. See you later. Right, thanks, this thanks everyone. I'm going to do a, a, a shameless plug because Jay mentioned Kai. Um, Kai Cheng Tom is going to be in Vancouver on March 21st uh, doing a presentation at UBC's Green College. I forget the title of the, the, the keynote, but it's really beautiful. It's about community healing, actually. Um, so yeah, check it out. It's, um, you can find it uh, at the UBC Social Justice Institute uh, Facebook page. So, great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Okay.